friends, I am Dr. Iram Rao. I teach in Delhi University and I have more than 21 years of teaching experience. Today, I am going to talk about macro and micronutrients. I am sure all of us enjoy eating food. Some of us live to eat, whereas there are others who want to just survive on food. Today, I am going to talk about the value of nutrients in our food. I am going to run you through the overview which talks about what are these particular nutrients, how much and in what quantity are they essential for us, look at the classification, sources, nutritional functions, also understand the bioavailability. I am sure this is something which would be genuinely interesting to all of us. We do not understand how to eat food in the right way. We will also look at what happens to food when you process it. Are we adding on nutrients or are we are losing out on this? So if you look at nutrients, the first question which comes to your mind is, what are they? These are substances which are required in small amount for us and they help us in performing the functions of the body. I'm sure all of us have understood the value of food because you start feeling hungry and you know that you need to fuel yourself. So it's required for energy. You want your children to grow strong and that's why when you are young, your requirements are much higher. And thereafter, once you've attained adulthood, you only require that much which is required for repair and maintenance. And besides that, all along life, we need to have good immunity. So it does help you to protect, protect against infections and certainly to regulate those metabolic processes of our body which cannot be seen by us. So food is for life, for sustenance. You are what you eat and that is why you behave in a certain fashion when you have, an ed you have a sugar rush. Sometimes you start feeling hypoglycemic or low on sugar when your body is deprived of it and that is why you rush for a candy. And that is here I am going to talk about that which are micronutrients and which are the micronutrients. As the word goes, Macronutrients means that they are required in major amounts in our body. The micronutrients are only required in small amounts. So if you are looking at nutrients, look at their broad classification. The important nutrients which are required for your growth, development and maintenance are carbohydrates, proteins, fats, vitamins, minerals and water. Water, remember, is extremely important and most often than not, we forget to drink enough water. As I've said, macronutrients are those which are required in major amounts. So this includes your carbohydrates, which constitute 60% of your diet, followed by fats or lipids and proteins. These two constitute 20% each. The micronutrients includes minerals, vitamins, and they are required only in small amounts. Having said that, there are a range of minerals again. You would require some of them in macro amounts like calcium and phosphorus, whereas you will require iron, iodine, etc. in very small amounts and that is why you also have micro minerals. Vitamins are split into fat soluble and water soluble. All of these, we are going to run them through or study in detail, understand where they come from what are their sources, what are the functions they perform in the body and how should they be ideally consumed. Beginning with carbohydrates, carbohydrates belong to a very large family of organic compounds. They are basically made up of carbon, hydrogen and oxygen atoms. After water, they make the largest amount or they are most abundant of nutrients which are required by our body. The main role of carbohydrates is to basically provide energy to the cells, specifically to the brain and also it is stored in the body for the rainy day, which means when you have exercised a lot or perhaps you have not been able to eat well or perhaps you are on days fast, at that time this carbohydrate which is stored in the body in the form of glycogen is broken down into glucose and readily made available for your body to perform its normal functions. The hydrogen and the oxygen atoms are present in the same ratio as that of water which is 2 is to 1. The various types of carbohydrates I am sure all of us are familiar with. 
You begin your day with a cup of beverage. Most of us like to sweeten it. So the sugar which you use is called as a simple sugar. It need not be acted upon by the enzymes in the body but it can be readily absorbed and that is why children are the ones who will consume larger amount of these particular sugars because they burn more energy, they are more physically active. But when you grow old, you do not require too much of sugar. Your requirement is that of complex carbohydrates. These carbohydrates are also of two types. One which are slowly metabolized in the body and those which are not digested by the body at all. And that is why when you need to have roughage of fiber in the body, we are able to digest only partially because fiber again is of two types. It is soluble and insoluble. The soluble fiber reaches the bloodstream, scavenges off the toxins or the substances like cholesterol which is not required in the body and the indigestible part is very good for your peristalsis. It gets rid of constipation or it is shunted out of the body. Again coming back to the classification, you have simple and complex carbohydrates. Simple ones include your monosaccharides which are glucose, fructose and galactose. Disaccharides are maltose, lactose and sucrose. And polysaccharides are starches including fibers and also glycogen which is present in the animal body. Now glucose is supposed to be a less sweet sugar whereas if you look at fructose it is abundantly present in the universe. All your fruits which taste sweet is nothing but fructose. All of us like to have honey on the toast. What is that? Again fructose. Lactose is the name of the sugar which is present in milk and maltose is what you get when you have sugarcane juice or perhaps when carbohydrates are metabolized you get maltose which are again broken down by the enzymes in the body to get you glucose which is required for your physical activity or to perform your daily tasks. Sucrose is nothing but table sugar. This is what you are using in your house or every day in sweetening your beverages or pre pre preparing your desserts. So what are the functions of carbohydrates? I'm sure we learned all of this way back in class 4th and 5th. But just to run you through, carbohydrates would include sources of energy which is coming from simple sugars. They are going to give energy to the structural components of every cell and that is why when you're low on simple sugars, what happens is you faint and that is why immediately sugar is given to the person. Similarly, carbohydrates also perform a function of detoxification which means if I have a lot of roughage in my diet, especially those who are suffering from metabolic disorders like diabetes or cardiovascular diseases, this fiber takes away the sugar from their, blood, from their bloodstream and throws it out of the body. So th these are some of the important functions of carbohydrates. Some of these sources come from roots and tubers such as potatoes, sweet potatoes, yam, coarse cereal grains. In fact, all the cereals are very good sources of carbohydrates. And again, as we've learned that sugar is a major source of carbohydrate. One sugar is table sugar, honey is another source and besides that a whole lot of processed foods like jams, jellies etc are loaded with sugar and that is why they are again very important sources. I am sure most of us do not know this but we have heard about what are probiotics. Probiotics are nothing which promote healthy bacteria in your GI tract. So what are prebiotics? Prebiotics are also substances which are obtained from carbohydrates called oligosaccharides which means that they are made up of approximately 3 to 10 monosaccharide units and they are not digested by the body or they are even kept in intact after the food is being cooked or baked. They provide food to those biotic bacteria which enter the gut and that is why they have huge functional benefits for our health. Some of the examples of prebiotics are bananas, onions, garlic. Today we have some good foods in the market or functional foods so to say 
which are manufactured after incorporating fructo oligosaccharides which are prebiotics or inulin or oligofructose or galacto oligosaccharides these are big words but they are simply prebiotics which are important for those bacteria which promote health in the body proteins life without protein is not possible they form the structural part of every single cell in a living being be it human plant or animal they are essential for life they are made up of carbon hydrogen oxygen nitrogen and sulfur they contain they are present in almost all living beings as i have said and life would not be possible without these particular simple units proteins provide roughly 4 kilo calories per gram proteins are made up of simple units called as amino acids there are two types of amino acids essential and non essential what are essential amino acids these amino acids are not manufactured or synthesized by the body and that is why it is very essential that when you eat food especially protein foods you must ensure that they contain the essential amino acids the non essential amino acids are 11 in number but the body is able to synthesize them and that is why there are no worries when it comes to the non essential amino acids in further slides we're going to look at what are the sources of these essential amino acids first look at the classification of proteins proteins can be classified in a number of methods one of the way is to classify based on the structure the other method is that on the composition so if you're looking at the structure of the protein when the amino acids are linked together and they form a fiber or a coil then they are called as fibrous proteins if they aggregate together they are called as globular proteins and if they independent of the either two then they are called as independent proteins if you're looking at the composition based classification you have simple proteins which are made up of small small units of amino acids for instance the albumin which is present in the egg is nothing but a simple protein similarly you have complex or conjugated proteins which means they are made up of just not amino acids but with the amino acids they also have a prosthetic group attached to it and this could be either a phosphate group or a carbohydrate so when a phosphate group is attached to it it is called as phosphoproteins or lipoproteins if a carbohydrate group is attached to it it is called as a glycoproteins the structural classification of proteins is made up of globular proteins these are proteins which have which are in the form of a coil and examples of these proteins are insulin we know that people who suffer from diabetes are short on insulin so globular proteins are nothing but the ones which are present in your hormone insulin you also have them in plasma albumin globulin and also all the enzymes which are used for metabolic processes are also globular proteins you have the fibrous proteins these are present in your hair so keratin myosin elastin collagen are some of the examples of fibrous proteins sources of proteins include both the ones which you get from animal sources and those which you get from the vegetable sources the animal sources are supposed to be complete proteins which means it contains all the nine essential amino acids which we mentioned earlier so if you have an egg you need not bother about the the composition of the proteins but if you are having let's say pulses or cereals these are called as partially complete proteins because they lack in either one or more amino acids now does this mean that indians who are largely vegetarian are deprived of proteins not at all there are ways and means how we can supplement and complement the protein quality the names of the limiting amino acids which are absent let's say in wheat is lysine and rice also if you look at pulses they are short on tryptophan and sulfur containing amino acids such as methionine whereas in maize you find that it is again lysine and tryptophan so the method of improving the protein quality is to mutually supplement these so you have many examples i'm sure all of us use this every day in our lives when you have khichdi that is nothing but a cereals pulse combination 
the deficient amino acid of the cereal is complemented by the pulses and vice versa. Similarly, when you have Missy Roti, that again is a brilliant example of a cereal, millet and a pulse combination. You can also have breakfast cereals with milk that complements the quality of the protein again. You can have milk and millet combination as well. So how can we create a complete protein? You can add your wheat to the pulse or you can use cornflakes or breakfast cereals, add that with some milk or yogurt and there you have complete protein. So India has a tradition of having complementary proteins or complete proteins. Sambar is another example of complete proteins because you eat sambar not alone, you tie it up with idli or dosa and that's where we have supplementation and combination. The functions of proteins are numerous. It is required for your hair and nails, to blood formation, to your brain, to your nervous system, for the formation of enzymes, for the formation of certain hormones, cellular messages and we can go on and on. So that means life without protein is impossible. It is required as a building unit, it is required in the development of the person, it is required in the maintenance, repair processes and all the metabolic processes in the body are dependent completely on proteins and that is why a healthy person must include at least 50 grams or 60 grams as the case may be with an adult female or male respectively of proteins daily in the diet irrespective of the age you are. Lipids is the other macronutrient which we are going to talk about. Fats and oils together are called as lipids. These are also organic compounds which contain carbon, hydrogen and oxygen atoms. Lipids are a major component of the adipose tissue which is found in animal foods in human body. Now we have two types of fats. One is called as a visible fat and the other one is called as an invisible fat. So what is a visible fat? Oils or fats which you can visually see. For instance, when you cook food, you cook it in oil. So that's a visible source of oil. When you put tadka in the dal, ghee is a visible source of oil. So what are the invisible sources of fat? When you have nuts and oil seeds, you cannot visualize the oil. And that is an example of an invisible fat. Similarly, milk is a source of invisible fat. It is only after processing the milk that you can take out butter or you convert it into ghee and that's a source of invisible fat as well. If you look at the structure of fats and oils, they contain what are called as triglycerides. In simple words, in the glycerol moiety, three fatty acids are attached and there you get your fatty component or you get the lipid. The structure of the lipids is broken into triglycerides and you also have the sterols. Besides that, you also have the phospholipids. So like in carbohydrates, the triglyceride would have glycerol and three fatty acid moiety. But if I'm looking at a phospholipid, then one of the fatty acid is replaced by phosphate group. And that is where you get your phospholipids. The basic differences between fats and oils are very simple. And we observe this in our daily lives. Fats usually are obtained from animal sources. Like we just mentioned, milk is an important source of fat. It is solid at room temperature, usually composed of high degree of saturated fatty acids. And that is why during winter specifically you see that even the desi ghee or clarified butter as we call it, it, it settled down. But if you look at oils, even during the winter season, you find the liquid at room temperature. So the oils come from the plant kingdom, they also come from the fishes and they have high degree of unsaturated fatty acid and that is why they do not solidify at room temperature. Sources of lipids are common. We find that there are certain fatty or oily fishes which are an important source of omega-3 fatty acids are extremely healthy for us. Besides that we have on animal sources, we have fish, we have poultry, we have eggs, milk and milk products are all sources of fats and for the oils we have all the oils coming from the vegetable sources. So from the plant kingdom you have sunflower oil, you have thill oil, you have mustard oil. 
the source is vegetarian and the oil is also liquid it's highly unsaturated and that is why for healthy living you need to have an ideal combination of saturated fatty acids and unsaturated fatty acids if you look at the composition of the lipids 99% in fact 98% is nothing but triglycerides and they come both from the plant sources as well as the animal sources it's only 2% of it which is phospholipids and hardly any amount come from the sterols there are certain sterols like ergosterol right this is also converted into vitamin d in the body and that's also a source of lipid or for instance whether you consume animal foods or not Cholesterol can be synthesized in the body and that's where you have 1% of sterol formation in the body irrespective of the fact whether you are vegetarian or a non-vegetarian. Functions of fat are very interesting. They provide concentrated source of energy. They help you in regulation of body temperature. They protect your vital organs from injury. They also help reduce certain vitamins and they also help you to store them nicely. They produce hormones, vitamins and other secretions and very important they are essential sources of fatty acids essential fatty acids have to be supplied daily in the diet and usually they come from the vegetable oils the different types of fats are saturated and unsaturated i'd like to concentrate on trans fats trans fats are nothing when vegetable oils are hydrogenated they become saturated lipids are also subjected to certain deteriorative changes upon storage there are two changes which actually take place there is something called as auto oxidative processes by which spontaneous reaction of molecular oxygen with lipids leads to oxidative deterioration and as a result peroxide formation takes place now when such a thing happens the fat starts smelling bad and it is not acceptable it becomes also viscous the color changes and this particular term is called as rancidity so it's just not fats and oils but also foods which are rich in fats and oils are subjected to rancidity if they have not been guarded with antioxidants so what are antioxidants antioxidants are substances which are added to these particular foods to slow down the oxidative or deteriorative changes this can also be taken care of by using vacuum packaging using inert gas while packaging these particular foods which are rich in fats and that's what we see in the market that a lot of snack foods come with inert gas filling and that is how it helps us in the extension of the shelf life. Refrigeration is another way of tackling this properly and also the right kind of packaging which protects it from the light. Micronutrients include minerals and vitamins. Minerals are again inorganic compounds which are required in traces in the body. They are also made up of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen and nitrogen. There are about 25 of them which are required in the body, but 16 of them are absolutely essential. The major ones are the ones which are required in more than 100 milligrams per day, whereas the micro ones are required in less than 100 milligrams per day. They perform multiple functions. They are required for building of bones, to teeth, to blood formation, to clotting of blood, and also to keep you away from iodine deficiency. If you do not have enough iodine in the body, then you're going to lead to goiter or hypothyroidism. Calcium rich foods include milk and milk products. It includes nuts and oil seeds, dark green leafy vegetables. But the best source of calcium is milk because it is accompanied with protein that helps in the absorption of milk in the body. Calcium with phosphorus is equally responsible and most foods which give you calcium also provide enough amount of phosphorus. Foods which are high in magnesium are brown rice, you have whole grain cereals, peanuts, fish, spinach. These are also high in magnesium. Iron rich foods come from animal foods as well as vegetarian sources. Animal rich food contain heme iron and they are readily absorbed in the body. Sources are your eggs, meat, fish, poultry. Whereas non heme iron sources include your coarse cereals, grains, nuts and oil seeds also dark green leafy vegetables these are not readily absorbed in the body and that is why we need to understand that what is it which will facilitate the uptake of iron in the later slides iodine is extremely important it is easily available in all the seafood but those people who are away from the coastal areas and do not have staple as fish 
need to include it daily in their diet and that is why the best source of iodine today is fortified salt. It is also important to remember that there are certain agents or there are certain foods which block the uptake of iron in the body and these are called as goitrogens. This is usually present in the cabbage family. It's also present in peanuts and soya bean. So you have to be careful if you're suffering from any iodine related disorder. Foods which are high in potassium are lots of fruits including banana, pineapple, potatoes, dark green leafy vegetables, juices such as citrus juices and also fish. The mineral bioavailability is extremely important. We have to understand that what increases the bioavailability of the minerals. For instance, for maximum iron absorption, we need to include vitamin C in our diet. Whereas for better absorption of calcium, we must have sufficient amount of vitamin D. Vitamin D is easily obtained from sunlight. In the absence of vitamin D, calcium even if incorporated in the diet cannot be absorbed and that is why today we have vitamin D deficiency as an endemic problem in our country although we are a tropical country. Animal proteins will enhance the zinc absorption. There are certain binders which block the uptake of these minerals. These are oxalates, phytates and polyphenols. Oxalates are present in cereals, Phytates are also present in cereals, greens, legumes and polyphenols are present in tannins and that is why tea even if you have 10 cups in the day will not provide you calcium because these polyphenolic compounds will block the milk calcium will not make it available to us. So bioavailability ranges it can be from 1% to 90% depending on the type of mineral and how are you consuming it. So the factors which affect bioavailability is the chemical form of the mineral present in the food. The reduced form of iron is better absorbed. There are certain substances which chelate the minerals. So if phytates are present, they will not allow the uptake of calcium. If fiber is present, it will not allow the uptake of calcium or iron. Redox activity of the food component, mineral-mineral interaction, as I said, Calcium and iron are antagonists. Both will not allow the absorption of either of them. That is why it is important to tie it up with the right mineral for its complete bioavailability. The physiological status of the individual is important. If you are lacking in iron or you are suffering from anemia, then the absorption of the iron will be maximized in the body. Processing of the food also affects the bioavailability of the nutrients. When you mill wheat, a lot of minerals are lost and that is why we have to be careful about the strategies of the food processing as well to maximize the bioavailability of the minerals. Micronutrients, we are going to talk about vitamins. Vitamins are of two types. You have water soluble vitamins and you have fat soluble vitamins. Water soluble vitamins are soluble in water. They get destroyed very easily. So even when you cut and chop your fruits and vegetables, or you heat process them, we find that most of it get lost. But when you look at the fat soluble vitamins, they dissolve in the fatty layer and that is why they can be even stored in the body easily. You also have certain provitamins in the body which help you to convert them. For instance, beta carotene can be converted into vitamin A and stored in the body. So what are the functions of vitamins? They are required for a multiple functions, required for normal growth and development, healthy maintenance of the cells, tissues, organs. They also required for gut flora. They are also synthesized sometimes by the body itself. For instance, vitamin D. When sun rays fall on it, it can be converted into 7 dehydrocholesterol and finally vitamin D. You also have some of the vitamins can be obtained as precursors. So when you have dark green leafy vegetables, they contain a lot of beta carotene or when you have carrots, they give you carotenoids and these can be easily converted into vitamin A in the body. Vitamins play a very important role as coenzymes. They facilitate in the metabolic processes of the body. For instance, B-complex vitamins are important for the digestion of carbohydrates. Sources of vitamins include vitamin A, which is present in milk and milk products. In a lot of non-vegetarian products, they also present as precursors in carrots, dark green leafy vegetables, tomatoes, 
protective foods like papaya, pineapple, etc. Vitamin D, as we say, that sun is the best source of vitamin D. Besides that, it is present in a lot of seafood. It is also present in those foods which have been fortified with uh, vitamin D. For instance, there is fortified milk by mother dairy which is available in the market with vitamin D. Vitamin D is another fat soluble vitamin. It is present only in wheat germ and wheat germ oil. But otherwise it is also present in traces like whole grain cereals, dark green leafy vegetables, dry beans, peas, nuts and oil seeds. Vitamin K is present in dark green leafy vegetables, cheese, egg yolk, etc. But the good part is that it can be also synthesized by the intestinal bifidus factor or the bacteria. So even if it is deficient in the diet, the body can make up for it. Water soluble vitamins are vitamin C and B complex. Vitamin C is abundant in citrus fruits like guava, amla, berries, cabbage, potatoes, broccoli, tomatoes, green leafy vegetables and also sprouted grains. It is also present in malt etc. Sources of vitamins in the B complex would include whole grain cereals, foods which are enriched or fortified with B complex, nuts and oil seeds, meat, fish, eggs, fermented foods and also it can be synthesized in the intestine. But not all the B complex vitamins can be synthesized in the intestines of the human being. Now we have to understand that there are certain processing losses which takes place specifically with water soluble vitamins. Vitamin C and vitamin B complexes are highly soluble in water and can be easily destroyed on cooking. They can be also destroyed when foods are cut, chopped, they leach out when you are chopping the food. They also leach out when you are boiling the food. And also the fat soluble vitamins are lost by oxidation when food is deep fried but they are less sensitive. Even after cooking the food, the food does retain the fat soluble vitamins. Applications of vitamins in the food processing includes fortified foods, enriched foods or restored foods. So when the nutrient losses takes place, it is the responsibility of the food processor to make sure that he restores the lost nutrient while being processed. So let's sum up macro and micronutrients. What are they? Macronutrients are carbohydrates, fats and proteins. They are required in large amounts in the body and that is why we have to understand their functions, where do they come from and in their deficiency what can happen to us. Besides, micronutrients include minerals and vitamins. Minerals are again of two types macro minerals which are required in larger amounts like calcium and phosphorus and micro elements which are required in smaller amounts like iron, iodine, magnesium, potassium etc. Vitamins are again classified as water soluble and for fat soluble vitamins. Water soluble vitamins are more sensitive, can be easily leached out, they can be destroyed on heating so that we have to make sure that you eat them in raw form as far as possible. Fat soluble vitamins are vitamin A, D, E and K. We have to take them in adequate amounts because they can also be stored in the body. We must also be careful in not consuming them in excess because that can also lead to toxicity. Besides, we have to understand the mineral mineral, vitamin mineral and nutrient interactions. There are few things which facilitate in the absorption of certain minerals. For instance, we've learned Iron should always combine with vitamin C for better absorption. Vitamin D has to be in the diet for perfect absorption of calcium. And if these minerals or vitamins are lost, they need to be replenished while the food is being processed. And then we have to look into what are the processed foods which have been fortified with these particular vitamins or minerals. That means it is quite important for us to read the labels before we buy the food. Thank you.